When being right is more important and getting your own way is more important than serenity, then you're a producer of confusion rather than harmony. The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting or its affiliates. The dialogue on this show should not be considered as medical, psychiatric, or professional advice and is delivered only as personal opinions from the host, co-host, and guest. KHLT Recovery Broadcasting is not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, The Monty Man. Well, greetings, family, and welcome to another fine broadcast here at Take12Radio.com on your internet dial. I am your host, The Monty Man. This is a Circuit Speaker Monday brought to you by Origins Behavioral Healthcare. Listen, are you suffering from addiction? Well, they understand. As men and women who have recovered from addictions themselves, they are familiar with the daily battles that you face. At Origins Recovery Centers, they have infused the latest medical research with wisdom from their own personal experiences to create a holistic approach to total recovery. But, Monty, I can't afford it. That's what you say, right? Well, they will work with you on this, whether or not you have insurance. Nothing is more expensive than continuing to drink and or use, right? Here's the number I want you to call. 1-844-843-8900. 1-844-843-8935. Or you can visit their website at originsrecovery.com. All right, this week's speaker is Bob D. Now, you're either going to love him or you're going to hate him. If you are serious about your recovery, regardless of what 12-step recovery program you're in, Uh, which uh, the successful recovery model comes out of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You can, you can uh, replace whatever word in there that you want to for alcohol, but, but that's where it comes from. If you're serious about your recovery, you're going to eat this up. You're going to love this. If you're not serious and you think that you can stay sober and recover by just warming a seat in the rooms of your 12 step support meetings, you're probably not going to want to listen to this. I'm just telling you like it is. Bob D. is sharing on AA failures, low recovery rates, suicides, and surrender. Here is Bob D. I'm Bob Darrell. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, So if we are convinced of the ABCs, step one, step two, basically, we were at step three. Convinced is is a pretty powerful word. Um. That's not mean, doesn't mean you, you sort of get it. No, convinced. One of the, the major differences uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous between now and what it was back in the 40s, thir- late 30s and 40s, and even up probably until the early 50s, maybe 51, 52, is that back in those days, if you look through AA history, you just didn't, there was not a horde of newcomers that just came to AA. You had to be sponsored into AA. As a matter of fact, if you read Working with Others, what they did is that they would interview you. And they were in, they would interview you before you never came. They wouldn't give you a chance to come to their meetings and dominate the meeting and talk about your issues. They had to interview you, and a group of guys would take you up at Dr. Bob's house. They'd take you upstairs, and they'd talk to you about the disease, or they'd come and see you in the hospital. And if they if they were convinced that you were convinced. They started to take you through the steps, and th- th- it was not a option. It, you didn't have the opportunity to say, well, let me go to your meetings for a year or two, and then I'll see if I want to. You, <laughs> you're not ready. Sorry, see you later. We'll be here if you ever want us. But, uh, And I think that's why the success rate back in those days was 75%. And now it's, I don't know. I have no idea. Two, maybe? I don't know. Two percent, maybe? Three? I don't know. Five? I don't know. But it's not, it's not 75. The forward to the second edition, which was written in 1955, Bill made a statement, and I've done a bunch of research to see if he was, if he was being 
overzealous in his statement, and I think he was pretty accurate. He said in 1955 when he wrote that, that 50 percent of all the people who came to AA, and then here's the qualifier, and really tried, that actually came here and did this, 50 percent never drank again the rest of their lives. And of the other 50 percent, half of them had had a relapse and then never drank again the rest of their life. And there was 25, the other 25 percent had said, well, it's, it's, he's, he uses a weird term. He says they showed improvement. And I think what that really means is that guys that uh, maybe would have died years before from alcoholism, maybe they didn't stay sober the rest of their life, but maybe they got 10 years that they wouldn't have had as a result of coming in and out of AA. So 70% of the people who tried Alcoholics Anonymous in those days got once and for all lifetime sobriety. Well, I ain't like that now. I got boxes of pictures at my house that I go through every once in a while of AA events that go back uh, to the late set to the 70s. And I look through those pictures of some of the big gatherings and stuff, and I, most of the people that I see in those pictures have died drunk, committed suicide, because it's different. You can come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for years and be a chronic slipper and never be required to do anything here. And... You can even come here for years and do that or come here and stay dry for years and never work any steps and sponsor other people and encourage them to just come to the meetings and share your feelings and don't you work any steps either and we'll just really get us all on the same. We will just, it's kind of like a fellowship that will we'll grow sick together. We just, you know. <laughs> We've had a rash of uh, suicides with long-term sobriety in Las Vegas uh, over the last uh, five years. A lot of people. The last one was a guy I'd known for years named Tim. 31 and a half years of sobriety, he blew his brains out. Sober. Sort of. He was on antidepressants. Tim had never worked the steps. Tim had stayed sober for 25 years as a result of a great sponsor, a guy named Mark. Mark was a great guy. Mark would hammer him about stuff constantly. Mark did, Mark did Tim's step 10 for him, I think, <laughs> every day, right? <laughs> and he was very active, and then Mark died of cancer, and uh, Tim never got another sponsor, stopped doing the deal, got depressed, got on antidepressants. So was on those for about four years, five years. I, th I don't know what happened. I think they quit working. He blew his brains out. Uh, my friend Frank, who got sober right before me, Frank would have had 26 years or 27 years maybe now. And when he was 23 and a half years sober, he put a plastic bag over his head with a rubber band, wrote a note to AA telling them about all his, he, he didn't, saying that he, declaring he didn't drink for out of his respect for as being chairman of our inner group and the founder of the Young People's Roundup, and uh, took his own life. Bright eyes at 17 years sober. Uh, <clears throat> put a pistol to her head. And Chuck, who was uh, with about, Chuck must have had 14 years. Chuck was, Chuck had become one of the greatest, greatest cardiac surgeons in the world. They used to, people had come to him from all over the world. He's one of the greatest heart specialists there was. Had everything. Put a 12-gauge shotgun to his head. It was a little more efficient. Um, Mike, who would have had nine years, was almost nine years sober, who was the co-owner of the world's largest Harley-Davidson dealership, one of the most successful construction companies in Las Vegas, made possibly seven figures a year. And he... At almost nine years sober, he took a 357. I think it was a three, maybe it was a 38. He took a pistol, shot his own reflection in the mirror, and then put the gun to his head and pulled the trigger, and it didn't kill him. And the police report said that he, in this huge mansion, that his big house he had, he staggered around there for 15 minutes, trailing blood until he eventually got up enough courage to shoot himself the second time. How do you shoot yourself the second time? 
what level of spiritual pain do you have to be in to shoot yourself the second time? And these are guys that had everything. Kids that loved them, opportunity, wealth, abundance, friends. They had everything outside, but they missed it in here. And some people get the luxury of missing it in there and it doesn't kill them, but we are different. So the book says we got to turn our will and our life over. We decided to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. Just what do we mean by that and just what do we do? The first requirement is that we be convinced Here's that word again. Convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Well, that's a hard thing to become convinced of, really. I mean, it, the problem with that, it's, it's a very similar delusion that I had for controlling and enjoying my drinking. The idea that I can control and enjoy my sobriety is just as delusional as the idea that I can control and enjoy my drinking. And the reason that drinking, the delusion was fortified, is that I had times in my drinking where I got away with it. There were a few instances where I would go out drinking, I I would have a good time, I would get laid, I would have some fun with the guys, things were going good, and I didn't get in a lot of trouble. And I, years later, even though those events, it wasn't like that anymore, I would always look back at those few times. And, and think how it's going to be like that again. And I do the same thing with running my own life. A lot, when you run your life on self-will, what happens is occasionally just the roll of the dice, occasionally it works out. Okay, but even a broken clock's right twice a day. It doesn't mean I can run my own life. It just it means that once in a while it works out. And I will look at the once in a while that it worked out and focus on that in the face of the other 30 instances where it got me alone and feeling like crap and depressed. And I'll look at that and fortify the illusion I can run my own life. So it's hard to become convinced. I think the only way most of us become convinced of that really is to try and fail. We crash and burn in sobriety sometimes or in the process of going in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous that we have, we surrender our inability to manage our own lives. And we're going to talk at great depth about what that means. On that basis, and they're talking about the basis of running our life on self-will, on that basis we are almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. My motives are always good. Even if I don't have good motives, give me a minute, I will come up with some. I have an infinite ability to rationalize, justify, or defend myself. I, I just I just am good like that. Uh, I was talking to a guy not too long ago who's, he's dry about seven or eight months and he's, he's gonna go, he's either gonna drink again or he's gonna surrender and he's on the verge. And we talk, I talked to him a lot about step, the first three steps and cause he can't get it. And I'll say things to him about surrender and you know what his, he'll say his response to me is, and you, when he says this, you know he doesn't get it. He says things to me back like, so, so you mean I'm not supposed to be ambitious? No. So, uh, you mean I'm not supposed to defend myself, stand up for myself? You know, he, he's, he can't, he doesn't get it. He can't get what surrender means, right? Uh, he, it, it, it's a frightening idea for him. Because if he doesn't stand up for himself and defend himself and manage things and make everything right, his great fear is, well, who will? Oh, what about that God thing? Who's me? What's he? What's his name? Um, God. That's right. God. Maybe God would. We're either everything or he's nothing. He either is or he isn't. Uh, some people, some of us have a hard time imagining that that could happen for us. The fear, the death grip we get on our own lives is overwhelming. It's hard to let go of. Hard to let go of. Most people try to live by self-propulsion. Each person is like an actor who wants to run the whole show, is forever trying to arrange the lights, the ballet, the scenery, the rest of the players, the people at work, the people in the family, the guys in my A group, 
the people in traffic, in my own way. If his arrangements would only stay put, if only people would do as he wished, the show would be great. Everybody, including himself, would be pleased and life would be wonderful. Wonderful. If they would only behave. In my early sobriety, my sponsor had me read these two and a half pages over and over and over and over again. And I don't get it. I'm reading about this actor who wants to run the whole show. And I, and I, I can't see that I'm that way. Now, I could see how there were a lot of people in AA like that. And I really wanted to tell them now that I know. Uh, and I, I kind of fantasized my sponsor wanted me to read this so I would understand what's wrong with these other people in our group so I could straighten them out, right? Uh, but I couldn't see it in me. There's a line in the 12 by 12 that says that we can see our defects of others. We're quick to see our defects of others, of our, our defects of character in others before we can ever see them in ourselves. And I could see you running the show. I could see that you were like the actor that was part of a cast that's trying to tell everybody else how to do their job. But I couldn't see. I could be doing the exact same actions, and I couldn't see that I was doing it. And the difference is when you're doing it, you're trying to run the show. You're trying to control. I am absolutely convinced when I'm doing the exact same actions, I'm not trying to run the show. I'm just trying to make things nice. Right? See, I think I'm right. That's why in the steps from step four through step ten, the whole the thrust of the steps in those steps is I got to get it when I'm wrong. I got to get to my judgments that may be not right. I got to stop defending myself and being willing to see, look at the exact nature of where I, of my wrongs. And continue to take personal inventory. And when I was wrong, I always thought, you know what I thought it said? And when I was bad. It doesn't say when you were bad. Probably admitted it. When you were wrong. When you're wrong about your boss. When you're wrong about the people you resent. When you're wrong about your ex. When you're wrong about your parents. When you're wrong about a lot of stuff. Is to step up to the plate and no longer to insist on being right and defend yourself. See, I'm a defensive kind of guy. I, I make a judgment about something and you've got to beat it out of me. I mean, I don't want to give it up. I want to be right. I don't want to be wrong. I'm the kind of guy, I'm the kind of guy that goes to court and they ask me to plead. And I say, guilty, your honor, uh, with an explanation. And by the time I've done the explanation, the whole courtroom is now going to think that he's not really guilty. Why did you even say you're guilty? You're not guilty. See, not really wrong. I don't want to be wrong. I want to, I'd rather die than be wrong. And recovery from alcoholism is a lot about being wrong and to stop defending myself. I had a great teacher in my early sobriety. He died of cancer years ago, but he was a wonderful guy named Dale. And Dale told me one time, and I got it. He said, kid, if you're justifying if you're rationalizing or if you're defending anything, you're wrong. Because you never have to defend, justify, or rationalize what is right. You will only ever be inclined to do that if you're wrong. And I never forgot that. And I'm a defensive kind of guy. And it is absolutely impossible to be surrendered and defended at the same time. They're mutually exclusive positions. You, it's, like, it's like going to a truce with a gun. <laughs> you can't do it. It's like you, you can't be surrendered and armed at the same time. I mean, it's not, you, it's not the deal. You've got to give up the defenses. You've got to give up the defenses. You've got to be wrong. In making these arrangements, our actor may be sometimes quite virtuous. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. Well, finally, a part of the book that applies to me. Oh, jeez. <laughs> oh, 
On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. But as with most of us, most humans, we are more likely to have varied traits. And you know what always has been my my nature is in my obsessive self-interest, in my drivenness, self-involved drivenness to align life so I will be better and more secure and more happy and more everything, so it's about me, in my drive to do that, I will always try to set it up and get my own way, first of all, by doing it through being kind and considerate, patient, generous, modest, self-sacrificing. And I'll tell you why. Because if you can get your way and do it that way, you get your way and you look good doing it. You look good doing it. You look humble. You look like a good guy. But I'll tell you something, if I, you, you, you screw with me, and I'm convinced it's got to be this way, I am just as capable of lying about you, backstabbing you. I'm just as capable of being deceptive. I'm just as capable of being mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. I'm just as capable. And I will feel justified because look what you're doing. And I will justify my behavior by your resistance to doing it my way. And I won't know that I'm doing that. I will think because it's because you are wrong. You are wrong. And this is important. (laughs) Do you ever have your your obsessive will not feel like it's important? (laughs) It's always important. It's a big deal. Big deal. Self-driven... Self-centered people are very serious people. We are, when we're in our efforts to run the show and arrange life to sort ourselves, to suit ourselves, we are, it's a serious, serious deal. Look, my license plate on my car says Rule 62. And I have to remember, because Rule 62, if you don't know what Rule 62, it comes out of the 12 by 12 in tradition number four. And it's a story, and the end result is Rule 62 is do not take yourself too damn seriously. Because seriousness is, is, is a symptom of self-involvement. Seriousness is a symptom of control. Seriousness is a symptom of someone who's running the universe. And you better not screw with me. Because it's got to be this way. I really try not to take myself too seriously. You know the best way to get your own way? Don't have one. Telling you the best way. You want to always get your own way? You know what it feels like when you get your own way? You always want to feel that way? Don't have a way. Don't have a way. And there's nothing to ever get ripped from you. What usually happens, the show doesn't come off very well. He begins to think life doesn't treat himself, treat him right. He decides to exert himself more. He becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or still more gracious, as the case may be. It doesn't matter whether it's demanding or gracious. I just got to make it right. Got to get you straightened out here. Got to get it right, as the case may be. Still, the play does not suit him because we never get it right. Get it almost right, but never really right. It never really suits me. I, I've never, through my efforts of self-will, once in my life went, okay, good. This is okay, good. This is just right. It always needs a little tweaking. It's always, I always got to maintain the control because I'm afraid somebody's going to turn on me. I always got to keep it right here. Even if I get it, even if I get you doing it my way, I got to watch you. I got to watch you. Make sure. And I may do it with the whip or I may do it with honey and flowers. Doesn't matter. I'm watching you. (laughs) Right? Hideous. Isn't that pathetic? Oh, jeez. Still the play does not suit him. Admitting admitting when it goes, when it turns to crap, admitting he may be somewhat, a little tiny bit at fault, he is sure other people are more to blame. Sure, absolutely convinced. 
The only time you'll ever hear an, an alcoholic with untreated alcoholism admit that he's wrong is when he secretly knows he's not. And he just says that to look good. Oh, I might be wrong. Let me explain it to you why I'm not. <laughs> Admitting he may be somewhat at fault, he is sure that other people are more to blame. He becomes angry, indignant, self-pitying, self-righteous, etc., etc. What is his basic trouble? What's the, what's the problem here? And it speculates, it says, is he not really a self-seeker even when trying to be kind? That when I'm kind and I'm generous and I look like the really good guy, if, you really, if I really got honest, really, and I peeled away all the layers of the onion and I got down to what's really going on, isn't it all about me? Aren't I kind and generous and all this other stuff because I want something from you? I want your love. I want your approval. I want you on my side. I want you to do something a certain way. I want you not to reject me. It's all about me. And I may dress it up and look, go through life and look like a loving, kind, generous, altruistic kind of guy but of real altruistic love, of real selflessness, there's absolutely none involved. It's all about me. The first, the first, my first endeavor to, to really learn how to love came through helping drunks, spending time with guys that, are, that were suffering severely from alcoholism, that had nothing going for them, that had lost everything. And I found myself falling in love with them for no reason because there was nothing they could do for me. They couldn't help me get a better job. These pukes are not even going to stay sober a year and give me credit for nothing. I mean, they're not, there's nothing they can do for me except that I started to love them because they were like me. The part of me that, is all, that I needed to love, I loved in them first. And then as a result, it came, I didn't, without even knowing it, I started to be okay with myself inside as a result of loving them. And this next line is the third delusion. We talked about the first two last night. The, the, the idea that somehow, someday, under the right set of circumstances, I will find a way to control and enjoy my drinking. And I'll jump state, start the party I'll be able to go out there and get high and keep the damage down enough to get away with it, to live with it. Sort of like do a drive-by, get back here in AA, that kind of illusion, right? The second delusion was that the idea that I am like other people, the delusion that I'm like other people, people who don't have alcoholism, or that I presently may be like other people, like after maybe five years of sobriety or ten years. I won't need AA anymore. I'll, I am better now, thank you. That delusion, the book says, has to be smashed. Those first delusions make my sobriety precarious. The first one kept me from getting in here, and the second one, I think, keeps people like me from staying here. I will incrementally, through my actions, move myself out of AA gradually over the years through the second delusion. And the third delusion that we're about to talk about is, I think, is what keeps guys like me from ever being happy here ever being connected here. I think it's a delusion that eventually, if, if pursued, will put, will put me in a place where I put enough screws to myself emotionally that I will have to take something for the way I feel. It says, is he not, am I not, a victim of the delusion that I can rest Rest. Satisfaction. You can hear the self-will in the word rest. Rest, satisfaction, and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. That goes down to the core of my being. It is the fiber of my life. This, this delusion that I can rest happiness and satisfaction out of this world by managing well. If I just get them to see, 
if I'm properly financed, if I had the right people love me, if I had a job that, where I didn't work for crap heads, if I, if I had, if my kids would grow up right, if I had a little better grade of friends, if I had a, if I had a nicer house, I need, I need the kind of house that when you walk in, you go, wow. Right? If I had the better car, if I had all these ducks lined up in a row, then as a result of my management and getting it all set up, then I am sure I will have rested happiness and satisfaction out of this life, that I will be satisfied and happy. And I'll tell you why that's a delusion. I don't think there's... I don't think there's a group of people on the face of the earth that have spent more time, more money, more energy, more obsessive self-focus on ourselves and trying to make ourselves happy. We've spent more energy on that than anything else on the face of the earth. And the end result is that most of us wished we were dead. That I am an absolute failure at resting happiness and satisfaction out of this world by managing well. You know all the suicides I talked about? And I could tell you, I could give you a list of probably 50 people that I've seen drink again after a number of years of sobriety. And I'll tell you what a lot of these guys have in common. They come into AA and they have absolutely nothing. Their alcohol and drug abuse have destroyed their life and rendered them down to nothing. They're bankrupt in every area. Early sobriety and create a wish list, a list of everything that they secretly imagine would need to be in place for them to be happy and satisfied. By the time they, when they, at the moment that they drink again, or these guys that have committed suicide, they would have fulfilled everything on the list. Isn't that weird? My friend Frank, who when he put the plastic bag over his head, he had everything. He, he's a guy that came into AA and he, the only thing he owned was an extra pair of underwear that was in a brown paper bag. And 23 years later, he's got a big house, a wife that's an ex-model. He's got a custom Harley Davidson, a custom truck, an old restored 1950-something Corvette. I mean, he's, he's making a six figures a year. He's got everything. Respect in the community. Everything that if he would have made the list, he would have been convinced. When I got all of this, man, I'll be there. I will have rested happiness and satisfaction out of this life. And when he got there and he had it all, after living there for a while, he took his own life. Isn't that weird? Wouldn't you think that all that abundance and have, that all that stuff would have at least in, improved the quality, something in his life? And I'll tell you what happens, and I understand this in depth. You cannot treat an inside spiritual malady with outside stuff. You can't do it. As a matter of fact, the outside stuff with untreated alcoholism doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. And I'll tell you why. When I was living in an abandoned building, it, one of the, I was one of the low points in my life. I felt awful. I was alone and desolate and wrapped up in my own fears and judgments and I felt like crap. But you know something? I looked like crap, too. I was dirty. My surroundings looked like crap. There was a continuity between my insides and my outsides. There was even, it was though it was awful, there was a funny sense of rightness about it. You get a guy like me, self-involved, self-obsessed, with all those fears and resentments and judgment and emptiness and frustration and loneliness and isolation and depression, and you put me on a backdrop of extreme abundance and wealth and a backdrop of everything I've ever suspected I would need to have to be happy. And the abundance does not make the vacancy smaller. It makes it stand out in starker and more painful relief. 
it doesn't help. It doesn't cause the problem, but the disillusionment of the, the, the fantasy and delusion of having it make it better and realizing the reality that it just makes it stand out and seem prospectively more painful is a drop. It's a tremendous drop. Tremendous. That's why the, the worst moment in an alcoholic's life is not when he loses everything. It's when he's gained everything out here with nothing changing in here. Because now I feel awful. And what do I do? Now there's a hopelessness. Now you've gotten to the end of the chain and the end of the string of human power. Got it all. What's wrong with me? I know. When I was 19, probably, years sober, I came back from a trip to Maui. I was going to Maui three, four times a year. I uh, I had made made more money and had more money than I could ever imagine. I could more money than I could spend in a lifetime. I had a half million dollars in cash in my checking account. In my garage, I, I had lived in this huge house up on a hill, looked over Las Vegas with the gardens and waterfalls, and I still I still live there today. Uh, in my garage, I had a. They just came out with the R's. Uh, I got the first one in Las Vegas, the XJR Jaguar. I had to pay an extra five grand for the privilege of having the first one on the market. Had a C5 uh, Corvette that I had put about 20 grand into extra. Had a 740 IL BMW. Two custom Harley Davidsons. One had been in a magazine and a van. I sat there in my house. I had absolutely everything. I had respect in the community. I had absolutely everything I could ever want. And I sat there and I was in such a deep depression. And I felt awful. And I felt like I was dying inside and I didn't know what was wrong. And the problem was that there wasn't anything wrong. Really. And that's the worst thing of all. It's when it's really, really wrong in here. But there's nothing really wrong out here. It's awful. It's awful. It's what makes guys want to kill themselves. And you can't tell anybody what it is because what do you say? Because they'll ask you, what's wrong? I don't know. I don't know. And I uh, I started thinking about everybody. It seemed like it was at a time when everybody's starting to get on these happy pills in AA. There's, I knew guys that were getting on these antidepressants and, you know, they were... And I started thinking, I wonder if I could talk my sponsor into letting me go on. And my sponsor is just one way. I mean, there's no, there's not even any discussion about that. It's either you're alcoholic and you treat your alcoholism with Alcoholics Anonymous, or if you can, if that stuff works for you, you shouldn't be here anyway. Go do something different. He's, 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 a, he's really kind of over the top. When I'm a little more open-minded, but he's like really one way about this. He would not let me take them. And I'm at a meeting, and uh, I'm at a meeting one night, and I'm telling this guy that's a friend of mine who's sober a little bit longer than me about it, about what's going on. And he nailed me. And I've been praying about it. And I'm still going to meetings. I'm still going to probably six meetings a week. And he told me, He told me exactly what had happened to me. And when he said it, it blew my mind, and I didn't understand it. And I didn't know how it had happened. He said to me, he said, Bob, he said, your primary purpose of staying sober and helping other drunks is no longer your primary purpose. Your prim- I mean, you still show up and act like somebody who that's important to, but somehow, incrementally, it's moved to probably fourth position in your life. Even though you still act like maybe you're interested in help, you can still go to the meetings and still sponsor people, but it is not your focus. He said, "Your Bob, your primary purpose is you. 
And when he said that, I thought, oh, my God, he's right. My first focus in my life had become my me and money and toys and my fun and my gratification. And I had become my primary purpose. And I'll tell you something. I didn't know that that had happened. And it didn't happen overnight. It was such a subtle, hideous, incremental shift in consciousness inside me gradually from where my life was devoted to the decision I made in step three in helping God's kids to all of a sudden I'm running it and it's all about me. I was the center again. I was the focus. And I didn't even know how that happened. I didn't sit down and decide to do that. It just slipped up on me. And because I was, things were so uh, seemingly successful externally, as I started to feel bad as I'm making that incremental jump, I don't get it because I can, I'm covering all the, the dis, all the, the emptiness up by throwing more stuff at it. I'm going, I, I've, I finally got myself in a position where I can actually create an endless series of self-gratifying events. Another car, another car, another car, another trip, another car, another this, another this, another. Until all of a sudden there ain't nothing left to buy and nowhere to go. Right? And then it's, as Chuck Chamberlain said, the alcoholic gets to a place where you can no longer put anything between you and you. And I got to the place I couldn't put anything, but I ran out of crap to put between me and me. And there I am, sitting in the living room of, the, of, the, of my dream house, feeling like I'm dying. Feeling like I'm dying. Victim of a delusion that I can wrest satisfaction and happiness out of this world if I only manage well. The guy that told me that I lost my primary purpose, that I was the center again, helped me a lot. Within a week, I had my car full of new guys. Within a week, I am on fire. Within a week, I am back to my primary purpose, and I have never looked back. I've never looked back. And I refuse to do that. I will. I talk. That's the one thing I work on. Them. I don't want to be. I, my life cannot be about me. Now I got to constantly remind myself of that, because I am constantly trying to lean in that direction, <laughs> right? But I, when I do step, I got, about that time, I started getting real serious about step 10 and 11 and 12. Real serious. Because it was the only thing I have to keep that from happening again. The book goes on to say, is it not evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things he wants? Don't get in my way. And do not his actions make each of them wish to retaliate, snatching all they can get out of the show. Is he not even in his best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? I'm a producer of confusion. I don't know it. I think you're I think you guys that are getting in my way are producing the confusion here. If you just get on board with my little plans and designs, there would be no confusion here. But see, when you run your life on self-will and you're trying to be God and you're trying to rest life to your own illusion of how it should be so you can ultimately feel better and be gratified and satisfied and happy, and you're trying to rest like that, you step on people's toes. You do. It's just the way it is. And I'm the kind of guy that uh, you could give me the best job I ever got. I'll go to work there. Everybody will welcome me and reach out to me and help me to feel like I fit. And within three weeks, I'm the guy that they're walking on eggshells around. Because I'm the guy who's trying to get them to do it right. And I'm the guy that's a producer of confusion. And it never looks that way to me. It looks like it's them. It looks like it's them. But see, they're all going with the flow, or at least to their own ability. They're trying to go with the flow, and most human beings are like that. Most people don't want to live in a state of conflict unless being right is more important to you than peace. 
right? <laughs> and when being right is more important and getting your own way is more important than serenity, then you're a producer of confusion rather than harmony. They're all singing the same song. They're all do, re, mi, fa. And I'm going me, 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 me. And I'm, I am the disharmony in the group, right? I'm the guy that's, I'm the, I'm the fly in the ointment. Our actor is self-centered. Egocentric, as people like to call it nowadays. He is like the retired businessman who lolls in the Florida sunshine in the winter, complaining of the sad state of the nation. The minister who sighs over the sins of the 20th century. Politicians and reformers who are sure all would be utopia if the rest of the world would only behave. The, the home group member who is sure that the group doesn't do things right. The outlaw safecracker who thinks society has wronged him and the alcoholic who has lost all and is locked up. What do all these guys have in common? The outlaw safecracker, the, the, the reformers and politicians, the, the retired businessman, the minister. They're all, the one thing that they all have in common, every example that Bill gives, is that they have all separated themselves from their fellows through their own judgment. The retired businessman who, sitting in the Florida sunshine, complaining of the bad state of the nation. The minister looking down on the sins of the 20th century. The politician and reformers who are sure if it could be better if you guys had just straighten up. He already left AA even though he's still sitting in the room because he's taken everybody's inventory there. They all stood, sit in a state of separation. And I think that from, and out of my experience, the alcoholism, the ism is I separate myself. And I do it through my judgment. I do it through playing God. Whatever our protestations are not most of us concerned with ourselves, our resentments, or our self-pity. Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. The root. Underneath everything. The root is what feeds the plant. What the plant cannot exist without the root. It is the source. And if that is true, then what they're saying is that the source of all my troubles, my discomfort, my lack of serenity, my lack of peace, my conflicts with people, my inability to integrate myself in society, the fact that I can't stay sober. All my troubles are come back to selfishness and self-centeredness. And yet, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I'm not stupid, but I'm very defended. And I could not see that I was self-centered. I couldn't see it. And I, there was a guy in my home group named Happy Jack. And Happy Jack used to quote this part of the book all the time. He used to say, selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, he used to talk about that. And, and Jack were, it was a, a sales manager for the Cadillac dealership in Las Vegas. So I'm off the streets, right? So I don't even like guys that are successful, basically. Right, but any, but I don't know that. And Jack would come to meetings, and one, and he'd always had a lot of jewelry on, and he'd have, he'd wear these three-piece suits. He'd come to a meeting one day, he'd be at the noon meeting, and he'd have a a blue three-piece suit, driving a blue Cadillac, blue shoes, blue tie. The next day, yellow three-piece suit, yellow Cadillac. The next day, black three-piece, and, and he would say, "Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of our troubles." And I'd look at him and think, "Yeah, I bet it is, Jack." Yeah. <laughs> I bet it is. And I didn't understand what they were talking about. I thought, now I thought he was self-centered because he was had a lot of stuff going for him. He was self-confident. He looked assured, self-assured. And I don't think I'm self-centered because I don't, I'm not like that. I feel very poorly about myself. I'm very insecure. I think, I don't think well of myself, but, and I do it a lot. 
I think about myself a lot. Constantly. And I'm sitting in a meeting one day, and I don't think I'm self-centered. And the subject, self-centeredness. And I'm sitting in the meeting, and I'm not even listening in the meeting because it's a discussion meeting. And I'm thinking about what I'll say if I'm called on, what you'll think of what I'm going to say, how maybe I should sit while saying it to, to look intelligent and deep. Uh, and then I'm thinking about my relationships and finance and job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this woman in the meeting, I barely caught it out of the peripheral of my listening, said, uh, she said that she went through life totally self-absorbed. And I sat there and went, oh, my God, self-absorbed. I, I got it. I was sitting there totally absorbed in myself, totally centered on myself and my problems and my stuff and my emotions and my life. And for the first time in my life, I started to get it. What they meant when they said selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. And self, selfish, self-involved, self-centered, self-focused, self-obsessed, self-concerned people like myself, we go through one through life really only concerned about one thing, how I feel. Because my how I feel is my constant emotional internal barometer. How am I doing? How am I doing? It's like, it's all about me. And so self-centered people who are obsessed with themselves and their internal reality and how they feel are a setup for anything that will make me feel better. So my whole life was a, a series of events where I ran away from things that, that, that made me uncomfortable, were difficult, that were painful, and ran to things that gratified me, validated me, made me feel better inside. And as a result, I never grew up. I didn't know how to defer gratification. It's like, uh, Bob, you want to dig this ditch or get drunk and get laid? Oh, let me see here. <laughs> well, digging the ditch will help you in the long run. Yeah, I'm sure it will. See you later. <laughs> right? I mean, right? It was always the gratification. Because when you're, when you're, when you got nothing in here, except the wind blowing through the pit of your soul, you gotta constantly and desperately, frantically try to fill that up. Gratify, gratify, gratify. Take me away from me. Distract me from this, from this. Take me away. <sighs> Selfishness, self-centeredness, that we think is the root of our troubles. And if that's true, then we are driven people. We're driven by a hundred forms of fear, anticipation, anxiety, apprehension, worry, the fear of losing something I got, I got to defend myself. The fear of being wrong. The fear of what you'll think of me. The fear of not getting something I got to get, man. You got to help. You got to help me here. You got to let's do it this way. It's got to got to get this. Driven by all these fears. Driven. Got to get the family right. Got to get this right. Got to get that right. Got to get it right. Driven by a hundred forms of fear, self delusion. Because I never see, I never see what's going on. I never see myself the way the other people that I'm trying to run the show around see me. I never see myself like that. I'm deluded. And also driven by self-seeking. I'm the guy that goes, to the, that's what's next. It's always about me. What can I bring into me? What can I, fill the hole, fill the hole. What's the next great thing? What's, what's this, what's this? Oh, great new car. Ah, that's the wrong color. Another new car. That's the wrong color. That's, 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 that's more, 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 more. Self-seeking and self-pity. And it's like you, you do it all, you fix it all, and it still don't work, and you feel sorry for yourself. I never understood how I was driven by self-pity. I'll tell, I, I tell you a good example. I was in early sobriety, and this guy was uh, in AA at this big party. And it was an open house party, but he would, 
I overheard him inviting someone to the party, telling him about the party, but everybody's invited to the party. But he never gave me a personal, he never realized how Bob needed a personal invitation. And I got, I got hurt. I started feeling sorry for myself. And the, the day of the party, uh, I'm sitting at home and I, I'm getting into it. You know, I'm thinking about what a great time they're all, they're all having. Let me see if bowling for dollars is on. The guy calls me up from the party. He says, why don't you come on up here? We're having a great time. This is, this is awesome. This is, come on up. No, I... I don't think I could do that. I'm just going to sit here. If they really would have wanted me, they would have called. He would have called. Well, he's right here. He wants you. Come, let me put him on. No, I don't think I'll talk to him right now. <laughs> it was pathetic. I'm telling you, it was pathetic. I'll just, I'm just going to sit here and think. <laughs> you guys have a good time. Don't worry about me. Driven by self-pity. Driven. I mean, like a martyr, right? It was awful. Driven by all of these things, by these fear, the self-delusion, the self-seeking, the self-pity. Driven by self. I step on the toes of other people, of my fellows. And I don't even know I'm doing it. I don't know and get it that in my desperate, frantic effort to arrange life to suit myself. That if you interfere with what I'm trying to do or give me a suggestion that, you know what I do? I don't even know I'm doing it. I discount your your suggestion as if you're a dummy. As if you're an idiot for even bringing it up because it's against my way. And as a result of being driven to get my own way, I step on the toes of all the people around me. Because I'm a producer of confusion rather than harmony. And what happens is they retaliate. Which is a very human, you step on somebody's toes, they're going to step on you. It's, it's like, if you've ever been around a control freak, if you've ever worked with one or been on a committee with one, a one that's like you but is doing it, it's after a while of being around somebody like that, you get, it, you get fed up to they're always trying to tell you how you're not doing it right. You get fed up by their trying to control you. Eventually, it's like it becomes like fair game to just screw with them. You know, you know after you they've stepped on your toes a few times, it's like you get this this sick kind of glee out of making them miserable, right? You know what I mean? And what happens is the guy that's running the show, me, if it's me, I don't get that that's going on. I don't even get that I've stepped on their toes. And all of a sudden, they're, re they're retaliating. And it says sometimes they will hurt us. And it says sometimes they will hurt us seemingly without provocation. Seemingly without any reason that I can connect. I don't know why they're doing this. But we invariably, it says, and this is the key, we will invariably means almost always. And this is kind of a vision of what I'm going to find in step four. It says we invariably find that at some time in this deal with this person, sometime in the past, if you go back a little bit, that I have made decisions based on self. Self-centered fears, my need to wrest happiness and satisfaction out of this world. It had to do with me and me getting my own way. I made decisions based on self, which later placed me with them in this relationship, in this conflict, in that place to be hurt. That I did it. I'm the guy that did it. If it, Most of the situations in my life where I've gone through life and I've felt like a victim, if I would have sat down and honestly, and as, I, as you will do in step four, honestly analyze the situation. I'll tell you what I found out. I have an ability to make people turn on me, but I don't see it. I've had jobs where I went to work there for, worked with really kind, nice people. But as a result of my own self-centeredness and selfishness and my own determination to to make it all be okay for me, I've stepped on people's toes. And I don't know that. And at the end result, as I'm leaving there, 
and I'm pissed, and I hate them all, and I think they're against me. And I don't get it that I'm the guy that did it. But I'll tell you something. If before going to work there, if I would have hired a board of psychiatrists and psychologists from a leading university, and I said, here's the personality profiles and all the people on this job, I want you to give me a set of actions and attitudes that I could exhibit to make all of these nice people turn on me so eventually they're going to force me out of there. Could you come up with a game plan? I'm telling you, they couldn't have come up with anything more effective than what I did. And yet I didn't even know I'm the guy that's doing it. I don't know. I'm the guy. And the great, the great freedom that comes through step four is, is that I will get it. I will get the freedom of being responsible for my life and the hope that if I'm the guy that's doing this, maybe if God's grace will help me move in a little different direction, I can stop running the show. Maybe I can be the guy that's, I can stop being the guy that's always leaving. Maybe I could stop being the guy that has those moments sober in the middle of the night where I wonder, what happened? How did it turn to crap like this? I didn't mean for it to be like this. When all the bluster is worn off and all the defensiveness and the justification and you're alone with you and you knew that you, you're the guy who did it again. So our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. They arise out of ourselves and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. Why do they say extreme? You know, Bill, why doesn't Bill say you know, Bob, you on occasion are sort of an example. No, he doesn't say that. He says, Bob, you're off the charts. You're an extreme example of self-will run riot. Though, this is the kicker, though he usually doesn't think so. There's never been a time in my life when I've been on a self-will binge, an extreme example of self-will run riot, where if you would have stopped me and said, Bob, do you think you're extreme? Said, no. I'm not. I'm just trying to make these things nice here. Either help me or get the hell out of my way. You know, <laughs> right? I don't. I don't think that I'm doing that. I don't think I am. But I am. Above, <laughs> above everything. Above everything. Above going to meetings. Above being on committees. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. And God makes that possible. There often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had, have had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we, could have li- we would have liked to. Neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own power. We had to have God's help. Once again, I am in a trap that I cannot spring. Just as I couldn't with the first half of step one, I can't with the second half of step one either. I can't think my way out of not wanting to drink And I can't think my way out of not being self-centered. The knowledge that I got from sitting in that meeting and realizing I was self-centered did not change the fact that I was self-centered. I remember thinking it would. I remember thinking, feeling like relieved, like thinking, oh, I get it. I'm self-centered. That's why I have problems in relationships and employment. And that's why I get in conflict. That's why I feel bad. That's why I get uptight because I'm running the show. Okay, I get it. Okay, good. Now I'm not going to be that way ever again. Wow. How do you take a guy that's that spent his whole life primarily being concerned with himself and then don't do that? I can't. I am as ingrained. I am. That's why in the third step prayer, I'm going to ask for something I need to be relieved of the bondage of self. I can't free myself. I can't spring the trap. 
I am in bondage of self. I am in bondage of my own self-involvement and self-concern. I don't know how to be anything different. And, I don't, and I, I'm powerless over it. I have to have God's help. I have to have God's help. And through the process of the 12 steps, as I clear away the things that keep me trying to control my life, through the resentments, fear, and sex inventory, the things that I I try to look for power in, and I get rid of them, and I uncover, discover, and discard the things that have been blocking me and keeping me in the control seat. As I do that and I become free, uh, God relieves me of the bondage of self because he will start to replace my self-concern with other concerned people. Through, as it says in the third step, if you will, God, if you'll take away these difficulties with this bondage of self, take them away for one reason and one reason only. Take away these difficulties so that victory over them would bear witness to those I would help. That means I am going to be free of this as a result of peep helping other people. Is his vehicle to relieve me of the bondage of self. Well, that's all we have time for this week on Speaker Monday here at Take 12 Radio. We are so glad that you've joined us. Please replay this. Make copies of it. uh, Play it for your home group. Play it for your friends. This is vital information. Once again, thanks to Origins Behavioral Healthcare and Origins Recovery Centers for sponsoring Speaker Monday. Until our next broadcast, this is the Monty Man wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye now. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting.